This episode of Tech News Day is sponsored by HelloFresh and by Honey. Now, first of all, before we get to the news, a huge thanks to everyone who tuned in for our election live stream on Tuesday, which thankfully did not end up being quite the descent into madness that our 2020 election stream We was. were able to temper our expectations and actually find some good that was happening. And, and there was a lot of good, despite what, uh, you know, there's a lot of argument uh, on the uh, cable news shows and online. But uh, as far as a midterm goes... The fact that it wasn't a red wave is actually pretty promising. Yeah. And the fact that Generation Z, thank you so much. I love that you make us look so terrible. Millennials look like shit compared to Generation Z yeah. as far as turning up for But at least voting. we still look better than Gen X. Yeah, that's true. But yeah, as long as you set your expectations low, which mm -hmm. we always do, the results were surprisingly okay. Yes. Right-wing pundits spent the last week forecasting a, a red wave, maybe even a red tsunami, mm -hmm. which simply did not happen. Uh, we won't know the full results for a while. And in the case of Georgia, which the Senate seems to hinge on, uh, we won't know until a month from now when they hold yet another election. But as Raphael Warnock is, uh, he's tired, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, after he, uh, running twice and having to go to a runoff twice. That's where Herschel Walker, uh, you know, he ran for uh, a million yards, so... That's the uh, thing, is what do you have, like 5,000 rushing yards in I college? I mean, know. that's what he does best. But yeah, as far as midterms go, especially midterms during uh, Democratic presidency, this was uh, not the kind of power shift that Republicans are used to. Mm -hmm. But it also wasn't the paradigm shift that a lot of you folks in Texas and Georgia were maybe hoping for. So, But pro I mean, uh, Georgia, I feel like, should have been more uh, decisively towards uh, the Democrats. Texas, I like the progress. I'm happy to see the progress, you know? Uh, that's good. But yeah, typically... no luck next time. <laughs> Typically, yes, the uh, the midterm elections tend to go uh, whatever the opposite of who the president is. That's how it typically tends to go. And the fact that it wasn't, you know, I, whatever, this is coping or whatever, but it was actually impressive if you look at the data. So there you go. On to the news now, though. And while we definitely expected the Elonization and muskification of Twitter to be a bit rocky at first, it has gone so far and above. It's just exceeded all of our expectations. And it's turned out to be a shit show on a on a scale that we couldn't have predicted. Yeah. Like we would have been called something beyond doomers for even getting close to saying what was actually happening. But it did. It's hard to keep track of uh, everything that's happened in the past week cuz there's a lot. But uh last time we covered what was going on at Twitter, Elon Musk was sharing blatantly fake news about the attack on Nancy Pelosi's husband to his millions of followers and uh was also brainstorming in real time for everyone to see. How much to charge users to have uh, their own verified blue check mark? Twenty dollars? All right, that's a little steep. Maybe I am disconnected from reality. Yeah. How about eight dollars? And then uh, he was eight dollars. He was so locked in on that price that uh, he turned it into his own meme, where he uh, falsely that'll be eight dollars. Kept telling people that they were going to be forced to pay eight dollars, despite that clearly not being the case because. That would you would have to assume that everyone wants a to a paid blue check mark, which is not true. In fact, it is a scarlet letter on the website now. It's been pretty fun. Yeah. So yeah, the, this plan to let users buy their own verified blue check marks is of course mostly motivated by the fact that Twitter notoriously doesn't make very much money. And now on top of that, the guy who owns Twitter owes a kind of insane amount of money on the loans that he took out to pay for Twitter. So Twitter is therefore much deeper in the hole than it even was before and typically has been in the past. So Elon needs to figure out how to turn a profit and fast. One strategy has been to lay off about half of Twitter's workforce to lower overhead costs. And we will update you a bit on how that's going on later yeah. in the episode. Oh, immediate effects, you say? But uh, getting more users to pay for Twitter Blue memberships could inject some much needed cash into this dumpster fire. And that's especially urgent because previously, advertising has made up most of Twitter's revenue, and advertisers aren't exactly stoked on the direction things are going right now. Yeah. And you see, advertisers like knowing that their ads aren't going to be popping up next to things that viewers will negatively associate with their products. It's some real basic advertising 101 stuff. Over the last several years, Twitter did a, a half-decent job of at least reassuring advertisers that they were doing their best to prevent that from happening. But Elon's plan for Twitter, which he's been open about since first offering to buy it back in April, was to ease up on a lot of the content moderation policies. Of course, in the interest of free speech. Free speech, yeah. Which sounds great to a lot of people, but um, the the reality of that, uh, specifically uh, the boundaries that will be tested 
and have been already, um, doesn't sound immediately great to advertisers. Uh, who immediately took a wait and see kind of stance on this, um, and Elon took that very offensively personally. And I took that personally. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, and he said, "Fuck them advertisers! I'm gonna go crazy." Uh, yeah. So uh, it would make sense for the advertisers to just put a pause on things and say, "Well, let's see what happens." Yeah, because there was uh, immediately a huge jump in hate speech and slurs and all that on the platform. This was measurable, and it was like, okay, well. Let's that's just not what we, that's the opposite of what we want. Let's uh, let's yeah. just hit pause. And but but instead of being let like the dust settle, instead of being like, all right, look, I'm Elon Musk. I just whatever. Let's give it like two weeks, and then I'll talk to the advertisers and say, look, everyone got it out of their system. Uh, not that that is a good thing. Yeah. But also, it's stabilizing because no one cares anymore. Maybe. Uh, instead, he went on the offensive. That's right. So <laughs> I mean, there's a pretty obvious cause and effect of why advertisers might be slowing down. Here, um, but Elon's response to companies feeling uncomfortable advertising on a platform where even the owner is posting political disinformation just days after acquiring the company was to tweet, Twitter has had a massive drop in revenue due to activist groups pressuring advertisers, even though nothing has changed with content moderation, and we did everything we could to appease the activists. Extremely messed up. They're trying to destroy free speech in America. Now, hilariously, Twitter's community-run fact-checking project Birdwatch is somehow still active, and Elon's own post has a clarification added pointing out that, uh, no, actually, advertisers are mostly worried about the, the misinformation and, and whatnot, actually. Uh, the CEO of the company is, is wrong, actually. Dead wrong. Uh, I, I, I love that it, within that thing, it's just like, by the way, yes, people are going to bother you because they're so angry at me, but you're, you're a coward for backing out. And also, uh, at, like, the last little bit of being like, Money actually is free speech because, by American definitions, that's yes. actually true because yes. of Citizens United. Corporations are people. Yes, they, uh, uh, the, <laughs> the activists on Twitter are trying to stifle free speech by stopping corporations from blasting advertising. Free speech is when you you pay me to advertise exactly. on my company's product. Uh, so, in the replies to that tweet, the most patient man alive, YouTuber Hank Green, replied to Musk with, "You tweeted a conspiracy theory from a website less credible than the National Enquirer like four days ago." We all need to look inward as well as outward. <laughs> to which Musk replied, and therefore Twitter should die? <laughs> uh, so he's, cl he's clearly not open to uh, differing opinions on his take. And that also includes differing opinions from the advertisers themselves. And I, I want to point out, like, differing opinions from people who literally loved Elon Musk, even recently after numerous uh, uh, missteps. He, yes. The man doesn't take criticism well. I don't want to call them out. I don't want to draw any more attention to the Elon Musk stands that have been all over the various websites, but even they have turned. This man's standum is crumbling. And that's all he had in the gas tank, too. Like, this man is not gaining new simps. He is he is shedding simps like crazy. Yeah, it's a weird strategy. When, yeah. when, even, when you've lost, I'll call it one out, uh, when you've lost Andrew Yang, yeah. uh, a man whose entire fan base is made up Lots of Elon of Musk crossover, stands. Yeah. yeah. It's the, the dumb guy, smart guy, or dumb guy who thinks he's a smart guy contingent. Yeah, you think you're, it's the meme of shoving a broomstick in the bicycle, but you think you're like adding a motor to it. But yeah, so like advertisers were directly telling Elon, um, no, you're wrong. Uh, for example, MMA Global is a marketing company whose list of partners includes seemingly every major business on earth. Seems like a pretty big deal. Yeah. Uh, their president and COO, Lou Pascalis, replied to Elon with the following threat. This is direct response. Yeah. Uh, Elon, great chat yesterday. As you heard overwhelmingly from senior advertisers on the call, the issue concerning us all is content moderation and its impact on brand safety slash suitability. You say you're committed to moderation, but you just laid off 75% of the moderation team. Advertisers are not being manipulated by activist groups. They're being compelled by established principles around the types of companies they can do business with. These principles include an assessment of the platform's commitment to brand safety and suitability. That includes the trustworthiness of the leadership team and the behavior of the CEO. You claimed yesterday that you are deeply committed to content moderation, yet today you've eliminated the vast majority of people who did that work for Twitter. How do we reconcile these? This is a, a major player in the advertising business who had literally been on a conference call with Elon a day earlier. I, this is also just another example of Elon Musk uh, uh, cursing himself into just being Twitter's customer service agent. Yeah. It didn't have to be this way. Also, Jack didn't do this. And and publicly, too. Yeah. This is, like, of all the dunking on Elon that has happened over the past 
week. Um, actual like representatives from major online ad agencies calling him out on the bullshit that he's spewing yeah. on his own platform is so good. It is. So yeah, I mean that that thread there seems like pretty straightforward and and polite response from yeah. exactly the sort of person that Elon needs on his side. So, Begging Elon to help him. So how did Elon respond? Uh, well, he blocked that guy. Mm -hmm. uh, he then doubled down by agreeing with one of his higher profile simps that instead of trying to win back advertisers, uh, he should instead organize a counter boycott of companies refusing to advertise on Twitter. Because free speech is when you pay me money to run ads. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, not paying me money to run ads, that's... That's cancel culture. Yeah, I agree. Anyway, this does not seem like a really especially smart strategy for luring advertisers back to Twitter. But hey, he's the billionaire. I'm not. Yeah. But in the meantime, uh, with $8 Twitter Blue subscriptions, maybe Twitter doesn't even need all that ad money. Well, we've done the math. They do. Uh, I mean, just doing some basic math here. Uh, if every single one of Twitter's 238 million daily active users signs up for Twitter Blue, I mean, that's $1.9 billion in monthly revenue. So... Checkmate advertisers. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, though, the idea that every single Twitter user would pay $8 a month is stupid. And one of the most baby brain CEO ideas I've ever heard. Some slightly more realistic math indicates that Elon only needs about one third of Twitter's users, around 78 million, to sign up for Blue in order to make up for all his ad money losses. But even that seems wildly optimistic. For a comparison, YouTube Premium has 50 million subscribers, accounting for just 2.5% of its users. So the $8 check mark might offset some of Twitter's losses, but it doesn't seem like there's any way that it can single-handedly save Twitter. No. Um, even And by the way, all of the math that's being put out, uh, us and otherwise, are numbers that are astronomical in terms of adoption. Yeah. Like, I don't think it'll get anywhere near that, especially within the first couple of months and years. Yeah, apparently, like, it's pretty standard. Like, the YouTube 2.5% uh, adoption rate mm -hmm. is pretty standard for these kinds of, uh, you know, optional paid uh, services. And I know you reference it a lot, but is it, it's because we saw all the crazy ideas that happened there. But literally, at one point during Machinima, they pitched the idea of charging people 5 to $10 a month for Machinima shows. And it was such a bad idea that everyone in the building was like, you are the dumbest person. Yeah, it's uh, some, some real hubris. But yeah, same thing. Oh, you've been getting this for free for years. I'm going to make it worse and charge for it. Yeah, and at least YouTube Premium eliminates all ads. Twitter Blue would only eliminate half the ads. And even that is an estimation based on what Elon is feeling. Yeah. Anyway, on Saturday, Twitter officially launched the new $8 Twitter Blue. And lots of people did sign up for it, but those people were frustrated to discover that they had just handed over $8 and had no blue check mark to show for it. Um, turns out that Twitter had decided to hold off on the check marks until after the election, which was actually a good call. Yeah. And now, as of uh, Wednesday and Thursday, there's, there's all sorts of random people on Twitter now who do have a verified check mark that they did not have before. Uh, but immediately following that weekend launch, there were surprisingly few people actually complaining about not having their promised check marks, and that's because, according to analytics firm Sensor Tower, only about thirty thousand users total signed up for Twitter Blue over the weekend during its big launch, which is uh, not a good sign. That would, is not nearly enough. Ah, uh, I would love to see the breakdown of NFT crypto people and that number. Oh, I'm sure it's a circle. Yes, that is yes. Uh, but hey, look, at least that's not nothing, right? That's uh. That's, with some quick math, that is enough to keep Twitter's servers running for a couple hours. Right? Yeah. Um, well, here's Casey Newston of The Platformer, um, who has a lot of insider connections at Twitter, to explain further. Other employees have warned about a secondary feature of the new blue that Musk added at the last minute, reducing ad load in the Twitter app by half. Estimates showed that Twitter will lose about $6 in ad revenue per user per month in the United States by making that change, sources said. Factoring in Apple and Google's share of the $8 monthly subscription, Twitter would likely lose money on Blue if the ad light plan is enacted. Quote, the business fundamentals are just not there, said one former employee who worked on the plans. Oh, so, okay, they're going to lose money on every person that, every person that signs up for Blue actually loses them more money than they would otherwise. I don't know where you've been the last decade, Elliot, but the, the business mantra is you got to lose money to make money. Yeah. This is fucking America, dude. Move fast and break things. Yes. Break everything. Uh-huh. And then don't fix them. Just break them. Just break them. Yeah. Yeah. 
Anyway, Square Blue isn't just a potential replacement for ad revenue. It's actually, it's completely at odds with ad revenue. Mm -hmm. Advertisers understandably do not like the idea of users being able to buy a blue check mark because that seems like a pretty easy way to spread misinformation or do a little bit of trolling. Mm -hmm. Coca-Cola is not going to be into the idea of anyone being able to pay $8 to impersonate Coca-Cola. We it's, put the cocaine back in the drink. Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty simple. Yeah. Uh, and just hours after the launch of the paid blue check marks, we were already seeing this play out for real, uh, like in this post from the official verified Nintendo of America account, sharing a photo of Mario giving the finger. Wow. I can't believe Nintendo would do this, except, yeah. whoops, sorry, that's, that's not the real Nintendo account, just someone who paid $8. Mm -hmm. But we're sure that the real Nintendo would have a nice laugh about it. Hey, yeah. fair play. And it, it actually uh, happened on the day of their latest Nintendo Direct as well. Like, so... Of all the days for that to happen from the <laughs> from the official account, yeah. it was like perfect timing in the sense that Twitter Blue was available and that was happening. It was just like a double whammy. Yeah, and there were lots and lots of other similar examples, uh, mostly just people joking around. There's a, a fake George Bush, a fake Rudy Giuliani, a fake, fake LeBron Blair. James uh, being like, "I requested a trade." Yeah, a lot of uh, fake athlete profiles saying they were retiring or getting trades. Uh, fake Ben Shapiro being a little pervert. Uh, the, the fake Rudy Giuliani uh, doing the uh, Tex Avery Wolf to Abby yeah. Shapiro. He's like, I, <laughs> humana, humana, humana. He had another one. He's like, I, I don't agree on Nancy. I don't agree with Nancy Pelosi on much, but you gotta admit those thangs are thanging. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, mostly just people doing doing jokes, uh, yeah. but also there were examples that were clearly people trying to scam money out of other people, uh, doing crypto scams like they always have, but now with the verified check mark. Literally, this if if it was the actual name, Twitter Blue would be Crypto Scam Plus. Yeah, yeah, it's a bonus feature for you crypto can bump scammers. up your scam numbers. Like crazy. Yeah, exactly. Um, so this, uh, of course, should not be a surprise to Elon Musk. We, we've said this multiple times. He's the most botted man on Earth. Yeah. He was warned by some of his own top Twitter users in the form of what can, we can best describe as kamikaze trolling. I'm going down. Uh, so over the weekend, several high-profile verified accounts on Twitter changed their display name and photo to masquerade as Elon Musk and tweeted things like, There's nothing better than waking up and enjoying a fresh, steaming cup of my own urine. Such a tangy way to start the day. And it's scientifically proven to help brain cells grow. If you want to be like me, drink your pee. <laughs> okay, Elon. It's sterile and I like the taste. Um, Ethan Klein of H3H3, he tweeted as Elon Musk, Even though Jeffrey Epstein committed horrible crimes, I do still miss him on nights like this for his warmth and camaraderie. Rest in peace, old friend. Uh, Musk quickly announced that anyone on Twitter engaging in impersonation without clearly specifying parody would be permanently suspended. Uh, so to stay within the rules, Ethan followed that up with a clarification that he's doing parody and also included that information in both his bio and his banner. Clearly, clearly above and beyond. Clearly this man is doing, doing parody. It's not real. Unfortunately, he and many others were still permanently banned from Twitter, even after doing as Elon Musk asked. And th this sh it should also be pointed out that these are previously power users. Yeah. A lot of people are probably on Twitter specifically to follow Ethan Klein from H3H3. And and there was a lot of uh, journalists, actors, uh, people in the media. These are the, yeah. the core of posters that Elon wants because they are actually producing the content that people want to see. And like, I have no love for Kathy Griffin, but she has a lot of, a lot of people were uh, followers of her. A lot of people logged onto Twitter to see what Kathy Griffin had tweeted sure, out. Yeah. And she's gone now, so... Yeah, there yeah. was a, there was a, the first like flush of people was all everyone just being like, yeah, fuck you. I don't care if you delete my account yeah. or my verified status. I'm already set up over on Mastodon. We're good. Yeah, or <laughs> wherever else. It's just like it, it was so funny to see. It was an impressive weekend in the in like as far as like you could go on direct action online, just being like, we actually don't care about this hell site. Yeah. It was awesome for a while. You're going to ruin it, and you can delete me for all I care. Yeah. Yeah. So to be clear, this kind of impersonation, it was always against the Twitter TOS. But Elon has made it pretty clear uh, for the past several months that he thought the only TOS Twitter needed was that U.S. Constitution, baby. Uh, he said back in April, By free speech, I simply mean that which matches the law. I am against censorship that goes far beyond the law. Impersonating other people on the internet is not against the law, especially if it's just jokes and not meant to scam anyone. But it has been against Twitter's TOS this whole time. And for good reason. As user Wild Jurders observed, 
Elon slowly learning there are reasons for the existing content moderation standards is just like watching libertarians try to start their own society. Yeah, no more rules. Oh, shit. Hmm. Well, I guess we may need a couple rules. I love this tweet because it uh, brought to my attention the book that I am almost finished with already. Uh, a libertarian walks into a bear. Yeah, yep. about that town in New Hampshire that... Uh, Let's start a town with no rules. Ah, oh, crap. Oh, I'm being mauled uh, by a bear. No. I guess we do need garbage men that we all pay for collectively. Yes. Anyway, despite Twitter verification being seen by many as some sort of uh, status symbol, and uh, Elon apparently sees it that way he, as well. It's the only thing he thinks it is. That is not what Twitter verification was ever actually about. The whole reason that Twitter added verification like 13 years ago was because they were literally being threatened with lawsuits by celebrities who were being impersonated. Verification does not mean this person is important and also good. It simply means this person or brand is actually who they say they are, mm -hmm. which is a vital feature for ensuring that noteworthy people and companies actually want to be on Twitter. Yes. So the idea of letting users get a verified badge just for paying $8 is totally counterintuitive to the actual original purpose of Twitter verification. It literally verifies nothing. It verifies you have $8 in your wallet. Yeah, it's that's the wallet that's verified. Yeah. Uh, also, in addition to the potential for disinformation, Twitter's existing verified power users, including many of Elon's fans, uh, seem pretty annoyed that suddenly anyone who pays $8 can direct message them and also clog up their verified notifications tab. So, uh, so as someone who did not pay for this, but has been verified for whatever no, reason, you, you for like, paid $20 for like five deal. years or whatever. Yes, there is a verified tab when you're on, uh, when you have a verified account. So you can only see responses and stuff from other verified accounts. It is elitism. Yeah. Uh, but it's elitism that was kept secret from the normies for so long. And now the normies have it. So they're just bothering people. I think it was like Ludwig. It's yeah. like a Twitch streamer was like, great, now I'm getting DMs from people who want to pay $8 to message me or yeah. something. Uh, so there you go. Anyways, at some point, it seems to have finally occurred to Elon that his Twitter blue plans would completely undo everything actually useful about Twitter verification. So Twitter announced another totally innovative new idea, a badge to go on to the profiles of major brands, government officials, and public figures to show that what you're looking at is the real official account. A verification badge, if you will. Oh, that's a great idea. Elon invented verification badges. Hey, hey, look, have a look at this new icon right here. There you go. Now, I hear some of you saying out there, you're saying, wow, that's the exact same icon as the Twitter verification badge. But you're wrong. You are wrong. There are clearly yeah. differences. The Twitter verification badge that doesn't actually verify anything is, of course, blue because it has to be. Otherwise, yeah. no one would buy it. This new verification icon, shiny, so shiny, had doesn't even have a blue tint. Yeah. Uh, it's just, uh, it's, it barely says anything. It's just, it feels like one of those things where you tag, uh, that you're doing something on it, but it serves the purpose yeah. of actually verifying it's the account. It's not a verif verified badge, but functionally it is a verified badge. Uh, aesthetically, visually, uh, unappealing and also stupid considering there's now two mm -hmm. separate verifications, but at least it did the job. So th therefore they're and going to gray. keep around. It's gray and it's outlined, so it's clearly different. Yeah. Uh, so they're going to keep this around to make sure that uh, Twitter is a safe place for everyone, right? Right. Um, so, yeah, Elon destroyed the actual function of the verified badge and added a new second verified badge to serve the purpose of the original verified badge. We are watching a modern genius at work and definitely not a guy very clumsily and publicly figuring things out as he goes. Mm -hmm. But hey, dumb as this may be, it will at least help reassure advertisers that Twitter is safe for them to advertise again and it's gone. It's gone. But so, yeah, just a couple hours after implementing that second new verified badge to serve the function of the old verified badge, uh, Elon announced in a reply to Marcus Brownlee that he had killed it without any further explanation. Just like, nah, nah. It's because like Marcus Brownlee and a handful of others are literally uh, unintentional beta testers. Because yeah. he actually, you can tell that he actually values their opinion. Yeah. He's like, ah, fuck. I have to listen because he's going to... But Marcus Bradley didn't even criticize it. He's just like, oh, look at that. I have a second badge. And then he's like, okay, now it's gone. Hmm. Yeah. So I don't know. It's, uh, you know, this is Twitter right now. We're trying a lot of different things. Yeah. We're throwing all the spaghetti at the wall and whatever sticks, that's the good spaghetti. Yeah. And um, none of the spaghetti's good, apparently. Yeah, so far, uh, nothing has worked. But, uh, you know, move fast, break things, uh, launch it without testing it yeah. uh, on a website that is... Uh, you know, whether you want to admit it or not, uh, has real life effects on society. Yeah, like there are government officials around the world on Twitter who um, it's probably pretty important that they are verified, they are, that uh, was verified in a real way that 
a real verified way and not just the same way that any Joe Schmo who pays eight dollars is. That seems kind of important. It's been pointed out in like in a lot of publications, but like it, it, it's very clear that Elon sees the blue check mark as something that he wants to extort money from like uh, Stephen King for, and yeah. not as a way to verify like even down to a local like city level public officials who actually there might be more damage done with that because it's believable right. that they are that person as as like instead of like making a fake Donald Trump account like the real danger comes at a local level and it seems like he has not uh, even thought of that or on a like foreign level and they they fired I, I think most of their layoffs were in their foreign offices and it's like this is that that's you're setting yourself up for a Facebook Myanmar situation where you have like literally no one even paying attention to what's happening in an entire fucking country we, we've said this uh, at least this year a couple times but uh, history repeating itself has been kicked into overdrive and we are doing it every year or two now yeah so it really is the end of history because we're just yeah, it's like it's now. like the end of a song where they need to hit five minutes, so they just yeah. do the reverb. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> whatever. Let it burn out. Anyways, uh, also on Wednesday, Musk held a Twitter Spaces session attended by reps from various big name brands, where he tried to reassure them about advertising on Twitter, but he also explained more of his long term vision for Twitter Blue, which is exciting, obviously, because when he pitches something, it always comes true, and it's the best. Yeah, what did he invent this time? Uh, here's CNN with more. Users who pay for Twitter Blue, the platform subscription service, will not be required to provide identifying information other than a credit card and a phone number, Musk confirmed. Twitter will eventually default to displaying tweets from Twitter Blue subscribers, while tweets from users who do not pay for a blue checkmark, he said, would be relegated to a separate page on the site and effectively buried unless viewers sought out that material. Cool. Uh, you, you killed the website. It, the website that, is... That's uh, the end of Twitter right there. Just, like, literally putting the basic... <laughs> functionality behind a paywall yeah um yeah wow also just no id needed like there were a bunch of uh like extremism researchers who were like all i had to just i bought like a, a disposable visa credit card and like used a vpn and i created a profile of like the crown prince of saudi arabia like verified everything looks great it literally took me five minutes anyone under the age of 50 knows how to, there are an, an unending amount of services that are, for good reason, provide security for your credit card and your phone number to give you virtual numbers yeah. and just allows this to be exploited. Elon and his simps, they're all like, huh, well, once we find them, we get to keep that $8, so that's free money for us. It's like, do you know what a chargeback is, you fucking idiot? Also, that's like pennies. Also, oh, yeah, uh, $8 to literally do damage that's worth potentially yeah. millions You're of dollars. You're scaring away all advertisers and big name brands, but hey, you get $8 here or there when you catch someone misusing Twitter Blue. Yeah, like, think about how easy it would be to scam someone for $8 with a blue check mark and a crypto link. Like, they're not doing this because they're going to lose money. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, he also announced that he plans to basically turn Twitter into Venmo. That's who I want controlling... Uh, any any access to the bank account? Uh-huh. Uh, here's CNN again. Musk's expansive plans for Twitter include adding financial products to the mix. <laughs> it could begin, he said, with Twitter allowing users to pay each other through the platform, with the company setting up each user with an initial gift of $10 to test it out. <laughs> Over time, Musk added, Twitter will offer the ability for users to transfer money out of its system to third-party banks, and then to market its own banking services. Quote, the next step would be a money market account so you can get an extremely high yield on your balance, Musk no. said. Adding that debit cards and checks could also be a part of the plan. We have, we have, do not trust this man with your money and also the uh, presumption of a high interest yield. This is him trying to free up some actual cash yeah. to pay his debts. Also, the fucking founder of Twitter had an entire financial services company that he didn't integrate into Twitter, for what I assume are yeah, obvious reasons. Yeah, that, that is a great point. Uh, Jack Dorsey was running two companies side by side, which you would think... One if, is an extremely established financial services brand. Yeah, not doing so hot these not, days. Not but, doing uh, great, but has already gone through the growing pains of financial regulation. Yeah. Like... People use it. Businesses use the fuck out of it. Yeah. So... so uh, yeah, that's a, great, that's a great point. Yes. I don't think uh, integrating Dogecoin into the fucking Twitter ecosystem is going to save the website, but again... I'm excited to watch him crash and burn. Yeah. Anyways, in addition to all that, another one of Elon's big brain ideas to bump up Twitter's revenue uh, is apparently putting just the entire site behind a paywall mm. with non-paying users allowed to use Twitter for a limited number of hours each month before they, they hit the paywall. Sort of like a lot of news sites. Mm -hmm. 
This is not something that Elon has publicly announced, but it is something that Twitter's beleaguered workforce is leaking to the press. And it seems to be one of many ideas for how to save Twitter, which would, in reality, pretty much destroy Twitter. Yes. Like, it's a terrible fucking idea. Yes. What are you doing? But speaking of those beleaguered Twitter employees, uh, the, the half that weren't laid off apparently have been working 80 hours a week. And some of the ones that were laid off reportedly were quickly asked to come back. Oops. Here's Bloomberg. Twitter Inc., after laying off roughly half the company on Friday following Elon Musk's $44 billion acquisition, is now reaching out to dozens of employees who lost their jobs and asking them to return. Some of those who are being asked to return were laid off by mistake, according to two people familiar with the moves. Others were let go before management realized that their work and experience may be necessary to build the new features Musk envisions, the people said, asking not to be identified discussing private information. No, and uh, you, you were a rounding error. Hopefully the people that were asked back were sure to uh, check their severance contracts and then, if applicable, uh, say, all right, give me $20,000. Yes. Right now. Also, $1,000 like, an hour. Let's fucking go. I love the idea. Oh, that you need me? The, the idea that, like, uh, you would want to come back from a company who mistakenly fired you because you're just an error on an Excel yeah. sheet. And then, like, oh, actually, we want to let you know how important you are. Yeah, get paid. Uh, yeah. Get, get, um, secure the bag and uh, enjoy it if you can. Or, or tell them to fuck off and enjoy the satisfaction. Because a lot of people that. are doing that and I yeah. appreciate them. No. For it. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it also turns out that those layoffs may have violated California and federal law by failing to provide enough notice. And Twitter is being sued over it. Mm -hmm. uh, the WARN Act of 1988 mandates that most employers with 100 or more employees has to provide 60 days notice that mass layoffs are coming. And this is something that Twitter's in-house legal team could have warned Elon about. Mm -hmm. It's pretty basic stuff. If he hadn't fired all of them immediately upon taking over. Uh, yeah, it's, he wanted to make a statement. That's all. And now he's going to pay the legal uh, ramifications for it. Yeah. Like, there's legal ways to do this. They're evil. But, like, they've companies have perfected this. They're like, yeah, do this many people today. Yeah. This many people next week. It's real basic shit. It's evil, but they already have it in place. And he was just like, no, I want to look terrible. Yeah. Uh, also, Elon uh, ended remote work. No more working from home. Get back in the office. Uh, so that's that's going to be great for morale. Everyone mm -hmm. loves uh, a job that you've worked comfortably from home. And been very for, productive for at. For the last three years at. They love being told suddenly, effective immediately, you got to you gotta come back into I work. Love, Twitter's office in LA is in Santa Monica too. So anyone who doesn't live on the West Side just had their days literally destroyed. Like their entire week, they're spending, you know... Yeah. Their their main office in San Francisco, I, I guarantee inaccessible. I guarantee you, at least ninety percent of the Bay Area Twitter employees do not live in the city of San Francisco. Especially after the change was made. Yeah, they live like an hour away yeah. uh, in that horrific Bay Area uh, traffic. So great news! You just lost two hours of your day. Not me. I sleep in a in a tent in the John Muir wilderness. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so look. yeah. Um, yeah, ending remote work, probably not going to be great for morale. And also ending remote work and saying uh, the next the next few months are going to be absolutely hellish. Yeah. By the way, uh, <laughs> you're, you're not doing remote work anymore, but you're also doing twice as many hours in the office. Yeah. So don't worry about traffic. So I guess just don't go home. Yeah. Sleep in your car. Fuck yeah, it. Yeah, traffic? Well, yeah, you're going to tell me there's traffic at 3 a.m. when you're going to and leaving from work? Just have another Red Bull. The, anyway, the Red Bulls are free. Anyways, that is uh, all the Twitter updates that we have for you as far as when we filmed this, which is like Thursday or something. This week's been insane. Um, but uh, in the hours between when we filmed and when this airs, literally anything could happen. Yeah. Anything. So keep that in your mind. It's been exciting. It's been um, the best and worst week of Twitter ever. Because you're no getting... No man has ever been this dunked upon. And, and uh, done such a bad job at pretending he's not mad. Yes, <laughs> pay, paying for the pleasure more than anyone has ever paid for anything. He's just been spamming that like sideways cry laughing emoji in so many replies and like that emoji, if, if someone's using that emoji, that means they are the maddest they've ever been. They're literally- They are steaming. That, the, that is the mask in front of the crying yeah. face emoji, but in, <laughs> in use, yeah. Yeah, no, you don't use that unless you are coping and seething, Yeah. so. He's having a bad... T that's the, the coolest thing about this is that you know Elon is having a fucking horrible time. He's having to do more work. He's a public embarrassment. He's become Twitter's customer service agent. His existing co companies are 
just crumbling Cratering. around him. Yes, he's lost uh, pr- uh, a significant portion of his actual uh, value, uh, and he owes money uh, all over town, <laughs> and the town is Earth, and yeah. the people who loaned it to him are not, uh, you know, the nicest people. Yeah. So we're this is a again. I think we said it like on the last major episode we did, but like this is a social and business experiment that you cannot pay for. Yes, once in a generation. Yes. Most business people are smart enough to, um, you know, not just telegraph to the public everything they're doing at all times. Yes. But that's not how Elon Elon does it. Move fast, break things, look like a fucking moron keep, publicly. Keep breaking things, break more things. And have a, an army of stands that just keep telling everyone else to wait and see. Mm-hmm. Anyway, we do have a little bit of non-Elon news for you today. Because um, you know, crypto... Has somehow co- managed to collapse even more than it already if, had before, if, you, if you'll believe that. If if it was crypto winter in the spring, it is a full-on it's blizzard right now. crypto nuclear winter Yeah, now. seriously. Uh, but first, this episode is sponsored by HelloFresh. Mm-hmm. With HelloFresh, you get farm-fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why... It's America's number one meal kit. The holidays are just around the corner. Elliot's already got his tree up. The presents are lovingly wrapped and set below, and music is playing on the record player. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah, but it makes this busy time of year easier. HelloFresh does. Uh, with chef-crafted recipes and pre-portioned ingredients delivered right to your door. So you can spend less time meal planning and prepping. With over 35 weekly recipes, there's something to please everyone. You can also easily customize your recipes by swapping proteins or sides, upgrading to choice proteins, or even adding protein to a veggie meal. We're big fans of the hearty autumn meals that HelloFresh offers around this time of year. And on this week's menu, they've got the Hall of Fame crispy kickin' cayenne chicken cutlets with mashed potatoes, Carrots and honey drizzle, which, mm. which clocks in at just 30 minutes of prep and cook time and looks damn delicious. We love how quick and efficient cooking with HelloFresh feels. Everything you need is it's right there in front of you, pre-measured, ready to go. So go to HelloFresh.com slash Newsday65 and use code Newsday65 for 65% off plus free shipping. Again, that is code Newsday65 at HelloFresh.com slash Newsday65 for 65% off plus free shipping. This episode is also sponsored by Honey, the easy way to save when shopping on your iPhone or computer. We all shop online and we've all seen that promo code field taunting us at checkout. But thanks to Honey, manually searching for coupon codes is a thing of the past. Honey is the free shopping tool that scours the internet for promo codes and applies the best one that it finds to your cart. So imagine you're shopping on one of your favorite sites, which you probably are Mm -hmm. at this time of year. When you check out, the Honey button appears and all you have to do is click apply coupons. Wait a few seconds as Honey searches for coupons it can find for that site. And if Honey finds a working coupon, you'll watch the prices drop. Like we said, this is the best time of year for it. Uh, Take all those savings if you get some gifts for the family members and buy something for yourself. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I've been uh, adding things to the wish list. And uh, using Honey every time because I'd like to save a little 10, 15 percent here. At the very least, maybe some free shipping. That's right. Yep. I still cherish my free lamp that I wouldn't own without uh, having that Honey promo code that gave uh, me that, my free lamp. Have you seen anything cool with your monocular lately? Uh, the I saw Jupiter. Yeah, there you go. I had to hold my hand real still, but uh, you need to get a little tripod for it. Make yeah, it look like a tiny little like uh, telescope. It. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, you know the holiday season's coming up, and soon enough you'll be able to see Santa Claus, yeah. uh, which is actually just the Starlink uh, satellites no, going across the sky. No, it's Santa. Uh, but anyways, yeah, you just uh, you can use it on your desktop, or obviously you can use it on your iPhone too. You just activate it on Safari on your phone, and you can save on the go. If you don't already have Honey, you could be straight up missing out. And by getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting our show. We wouldn't recommend something we don't use, so get Honey for free today at joinhoney.com slash itdaily. That is joinhoney.com slash itdaily. All right, back now with more news. And as you're aware, there's there's been a so-called crypto winter going on for the last several months. Mm-hmm. Um, prices for once soaring cryptocurrencies are back where they were two years earlier and on a downward trajectory. And this is partly due to the same economic downturn affecting like the stock market and everything else. But it's mainly due to stuff like the complete collapse of the Terra Luna ecosystem, which made a lot of people's money basically disappear and made a lot more people stop and wonder if maybe crypto isn't the safest way to store one's money and is actually a very delicate house of cards. Uh, We are not going to re-explain Terra Luna again. We did make a video about it back in May, if you're curious. Um, But uh, yeah, it's one of those things. Everything sounds great when things are going great. Yes. And then all it takes is... Just a little bit of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. 
that flood that these people hate, mm -hmm. for the whole thing to come crashing down. Yes. Uh, now, what we're here to discuss today is FTX. Oh, I know them. Yes, they sponsor all of those sports teams, yeah. and uh, they seem like a reputable company. A what real with all the company, ad yeah. spending and yeah. uh, endorsements. Uh, why, why, Tom Brady, the greatest football player of all time. They got, they paid Larry David a lot of money to... Uh, Hopefully he took the cash payout. I'm pretty sure he did. Yes. Uh, so FTX is one of the biggest cryptocurrency exchanges around, and even normies will recognize them from their expensive Super Bowl ads and the fact that the Miami Heat play in the FTX arena. For now. <laughs> uh, FTX has seemed up until now like a pretty stable and reliable service out of all the potential options out there. Mm -hmm. Proof that crypto is obviously here to stay. But uh, that all changed over the course of just a few days, just like they do with every crypto problem. It's one day it's here, the next it's gone. Now, not only has FTX collapsed, but it sent the wider crypto world into an even bigger crisis than it was already in. And to explain exactly what went down, here's Coindesk. Documents uncovered last week by Coindesk showed that Alameda Research, a trading and investment juggernaut founded by SBF, the guy who also founded FTX, had its finances deeply intertwined with those of FTX. FTX was supposed to be a separate company from Alameda, but Alameda apparently held a disproportionate amount of its balance sheet in FTX's exchange token, FTT. That token was illiquid, with Alameda and FTX owning a vast majority of all the tokens in circulation. Selling them would have meant crashing the price of FTT, meaning their value on Alameda's balance sheet was likely overstated. When documents showed that Alameda had been borrowing millions of dollars against FTT, rumors spread across Twitter that FTX was loaning out user funds to Alameda and using its own illiquid FTT token as collateral, essentially printing money so it could lend user funds to itself. These rumors are far from confirmed, but they were the first inkling for many that deposits in the FTX exchange were not as safe as hoped. And if you didn't understand that, it's fine. It's, you don't it's, need to. Uh, <laughs> money go poof because greedy people run yeah, company. Yeah. It's, uh, the, the most frustrating thing about crypto is you have to like, you have to basically give yourself a crash course on like a lot of pretty deep economics concepts just to understand why something does not work and, and never will. Also essentially become a day trader to monitor the uh, your balance so that it doesn't either disappear. Yeah. Or uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot of work that people kind of, literally stumbled into during the pandemic because they were home and like, huh, all yeah. right, cool. But basically the worry was uh, if you put money into FTX in the form of their stablecoin or whatever, FTT, the worry was uh, maybe your money isn't actually there. And maybe if you try to pull it out, if enough of us try to all pull it out at once, uh, some of us are going to be left holding and back. And it's almost like we have a recent historical precedent for this. Multiple examples. Yes. Yeah. Um, so anyway, Zhang Peng Zhao, a.k.a. CZ, the CEO of Binance, one of FTX's competitors, was happy to publicly fan the fire of doubt swirling around whether FTX was actually good for all the money it was storing. And over just a few days, many of F FTX's users started panic selling their FTT tokens, fearing that if they waited too long, those tokens would be worthless. FTX then paused user, user withdrawals, uh, as is tradition, <laughs> uh, which only increased the panic. CZ and Binance then stepped in to offer to buy up FTX, but then backed out after they just looked at FTX's books and decided that things were more fucked than they'd be able to fix. They did literally the one thing that Elon Musk couldn't do for himself. Look at the oh, books. Oh, never mind then. Yeah. yeah. FTX has since unpaused withdrawals, indicating that they were able to get their shit somewhat in order over the past few days, but faith in the stability of FTX has been partially shattered. And with it, the faith that long-term stability is even possible in the cryptocurrency space. This is one of the biggest, this crypto.com and like maybe one or two others are, they might as well be like the this Lehman Brothers. Like, yeah, it's like, it, yeah. they're, they're calling this uh, the crypto world's Lehman Brothers yeah. moment. Um, yeah, it's, it's as if like Bank of America suddenly. It was like, all your money's gone. Yeah. And we gave it to Wells Fargo. Like, and by the way, we also own at Wells Fargo. Like you, you say what you will about the American like financial, uh, you know, infrastructure, but the the government and the banking industry has done a great job over the last hundred years of instilling confidence in its customers that the money's there. Even if the bank goes out of business, you don't lose the money. It's insured by the government. Um, yeah. Crypto doesn't have any of that shit. Regulations that were writ in the deaths of uh, thousands of people, yeah. millions of people who uh, lost everything multiple yeah. times throughout our country's history. As libertarians love to forget, uh, every law is written, written in, in blood. blood. Yeah. <laughs> 
Anyways, let's read some selections from the New York Times' coverage of this that adds further context to what a big deal this all was. Mm -hmm. Over the last two years, Sam Bankman-Fried, a 30-year-old entrepreneur, built a crypto exchange called FTX into a $32 billion company. He spent hundreds of millions of dollars to prop up struggling crypto firms, and he became a major political donor to Joseph R. Biden Jr.'s presidential campaign, as well as a frequent welcome presence in the halls of Congress. Then, in a matter of days, it was suddenly Mr. Bankman-Fried who needed a bailout, thanks in large part to Twitter posts from a rival that questioned the stability of FTX's business. The tweet sparked what was essentially a three-day bank run of an estimated $6 billion that sent FTX into crisis. Uh, so here's some more from that article. The deal's collapse has sent shutters through the entire crypto industry. The uncertainty around the future of FTX has become an existential threat to young crypto businesses as they struggle to convince Wall Street, regulators, and mainstream consumers that they are trustworthy. As news spread of FTX's collapse, crypto markets took a battering, with Bitcoin and Ether both dropping more than 20% in value since Tuesday. On Wednesday evening, Sequoia Capital, one of FTX's largest backers, said it now considered its $213 million investment worthless in a letter to its own investors. The firm said FTX was at risk of bankruptcy, though it didn't know the full nature and extent of the risk. This episode highlights the vulnerability of the entire crypto edifice, said Ezwar Prasad, a Cornell University economics professor. Even large and apparently financially solid institutions turn out to have fragile and shaky foundations that crumble at the least hint of trouble. Many of crypto's foundational myths have already been punctured this year, and FTX's rapid fall suggests that no company in this freewheeling, loosely regulated industry is safe from extreme volatility. Yeah, that would seem to be the case. Mm -hmm. Uh, anyway, there's a lot more to this that we're not going to bother getting into. Um, but yeah, basically, this is yet another example of the, the difference between crypto and traditional finance. When things are running smoothly, it's great. Hell yeah. Me reaping? Hell yeah. Mm -hmm. Love it. Me sowing? Oh no. This sucks. Yeah, when shit hits the fan with crypto, it really, really, really hits the fan. And at least with banks, when the banks fail, your money is insured by the government. When crypto exchanges fail, there is no guarantee you're ever getting your money back, or if your money was ever even being stored there in the first place. Nope. But it's fine because uh, it's on the blockchain, you see. The transaction's there. I mean, uh, we can prove that you did it, I guess. Yeah. But what what you bought was worthless because of our own actions, you see. And it's gone. Mm -hmm. Literally South Park episode. Mm -hmm. It's gone. Uh, so yeah, I'm sure there's more to come from that. Uh, although, uh, but this is this is another slight on crypto because... Over the past two years, um, constantly, despite the clear evidence that it is directly tied to the health of the U.S. economy and stock market, it is constantly uh, presented as a hedge on like inflation. I don't think anyone believes that anymore. You, it's literally just set it on top. Uh, it, like today, the inflation numbers were a slightly better than what they had expected. So the stock market went up and it's like, OK, crypto went up and it's like. It's yeah. clearly tied to the. But, but crypto. Yeah, got a nice little bump after dropping like 20% in one day. Yeah, it's that uh, if you earlier in the week. It's the old meme of like, if you're worried now, just zoom out and everything yeah. will be fine. It's yeah. the opposite now. If you zoom out, you're like, your small wins mean nothing. Yeah, dude, it's fucking crazy. Yeah, I'm really excited for apparently Ben McKenzie is releasing a full documentary about, about this. Because yeah. he was tweeting about all the shit with FTX this week. And he's like, if there was only someone who had lengthy, recorded conversations and interviews with all the major players in this industry. That someone could potentially re release a full documentary. I hope it's O.C. Ryan who did all that. Yes. Because I love O.C. Ryan. Yes. I think that that would be a great, fun thing Gordon. to watch. Yeah. Anyways, uh, that's it for our episode today. We had a lot to catch up on. Obviously, this week's been a little bit weird. I was traveling, and then we had the election. Uh, so we do have more episodes coming out for you this week. About a little, everything was a little staggered, but uh, you got a whole lot in one episode. So you're welcome. And uh, thank you again to everyone who watched the election stream, especially everyone who was kind enough to use the Super Chats or become a new member. We really, really appreciate it. And... Uh, Thanks for just being there. It was fun to hang out with everyone. In the meantime, uh, if you want to watch something, we have six hours of ele election coverage yeah, that is now you, inaccurate. If you missed it, it's there. You can watch it on double speed. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, we also have uh, our previous episode of Weekly Weird News about Rainbow Fentanyl. And uh, with News Dump, we'll try to have some more uh, finalized information about the elections as well as some other things. So stay tuned for that, and we'll see you soon. Subscribe, like, comment. Bye. Bye.